Well, it's so good to see everyone here tonight. We're so thankful for your presence and especially those that are watching online. Thank you for being with us tonight as well. Did everyone get a sheet? Maybe not that one. This one. Did everybody get one of these? It's, if you got a sheet, you probably got this one. So, all right. Now we're in good shape. Let's have a word of prayer as we get started. Our Father, which are in heaven, we are again so thankful for your watch, care, and protection. We're so thankful for the many blessings that we're able to enjoy. Father, thank you. We can't thank you enough for what your son has done for us by coming to this earth to live and to die for us. And by our faith and obedience, we can have the hope of eternal life in heaven with thee. Father, we know that there are many that are sick and afflicted at this time. We ask thee to watch over them, help them to a better portion of health. Those that are seeing doctors and nurses, that you'll be with them, that they'll help them along the ways to get better through the medicines and the therapies. But Father, we are reminded of so many that are spiritually sick as well. And we pray that they will see the error of their way and come back and be in the right relationship with thee once again. Father, we ask thee to be with us in our class as we study thy word. And that we take the things that we learn and apply them to our hearts and minds so that we can be better servants for thee. In the end, save us if we've been found faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week, we began looking at types and antitypes. And with types and antitypes, God would illustrate a New Testament truth looking through faint pictures of that truth in the Old Testament. So, with that in mind, the Hebrews writer explained that the law of Moses was a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things, Hebrews 10 and verse 1. He also wrote of the holy places that were made with hands, which are the figures of the true in Hebrews 9, 24. And so the Old Testament types are not the very thing or the very image of the thing, but rather a figure of of the true, a type. Familiar to many would be the water that lifted Noah's Ark from the sinful pre-flood world. The water had typified the waters of baptism in the New Testament, just as that ancient water carried eight souls, his family, from a sinful world into a sin-free world. Baptismal waters can carry sinners from this sinful world into a sin-free world as well, 1 Peter 3, 20 and 21. Even though we might not hear the t terms type and any type, I think that we certainly can be familiar with the concepts through some of the hymns that are in our songbook. Like for instance, as Christians, we can sing, To Canaan's land, I'm on my way. Well, we're not going to Canaan's land, but we know that Canaan land is a type of heaven, right? It's a type of heaven. We're not going to the literal Canaan. But the meaning of the song is clear. To heaven, I'm on my way, right? Now, I won't have to cross Jordan alone. Now, I know that we don't have to go to the Jordan River to cross it. But we understand that crossing the Jordan is death. And thus, we won't cross death alone. God will be with us. And so, death is the antitype. The reality in the Jordan River is merely just a type, a faint picture of death. 
Types are also used in other sacred songs, such as on Jordan's stormy banks, I stand. Or sing on, ye joyful pilgrims. So tonight, we want to notice just how Noah's Ark paints a faint picture of the church for which Jesus of Nazareth had suffered. Now, I want to explain just exactly how this is going to work. And tonight, we're just going to stick. If, you, if you'll notice, on your sheet, one side is the ark. The other side is the church. So the ark, the type of the church. Now, tonight, I'm going to just go down all these ones on the ark side. But I'll tell you what number, and I'll tell you the answer. And then we'll go to the second section of the church, and we'll go by number as well there. Some of these, if you know your Bible and you know about Noah and the ark, already know some of these answers. But that's okay, and we'll go through them with you. Now, you remember that man's sinfulness prior to the worldwide flood had hurt God. In fact, Moses wrote that it grieved him at his heart because man became so wicked that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually, Genesis 6, 5 and 6. God decreed, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me, or regret, that I had made them, Genesis 6, 7. And so we learn that God's method of destruction was this worldwide flood. It was such magnitude that the Waters had prevailed exceedingly upon the earth and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. That's how we know that this is a worldwide flood. There's so many in the world that are thinking that it was just a localized flood. But if God said through the pen of Moses to write down that the whole earth was covered, Everything under heaven were covered. Fifteen cubits upward did the waters prevail and the mountains were covered. Then we know that it was a worldwide flood. And that's true. Otherwise, God lied. But then it says in Titus that God never lies. So again... We have to know and, and believe that this is true, Genesis 7, 19 and 20. So destruction was inevitable for the sinful inhabitants of the earth. Now, because God decided he was going to destroy the earth and everything on it, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Uh, Max, would you let... Uh, Sister Maddie in. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, Genesis 6, 8. And so in a marvelous act of divine grace, God decided to spare Noah and his family from the flood. Number one, on the ark side, the builder is who? Noah. Noah, God's faithful servant. So God, or Noah, is the builder of this. Now, number two, he commanded Noah to use one particular material. What was that material? Gopher wood. Gopher wood. Make an ark of gopher wood, Genesis 6, 14. It was only in that ark that Noah could have been saved from this worldwide flood, deluge. Through his obedient faith, Noah, being warned of things of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of this house, his house, 
by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith, Hebrews 11, 7. Now this ark had only one source of light. What was that? The one window. The one window, Genesis 6, 16. One source of light. Now I want you to keep this in mind Because by contrast, when we get to the church, some of these answers are going to be somewhat similar, but yet not the same, but similar, okay? Now, there was only how many doors? One One door. So there was only one entrance into the ark. The ark must have been a magnificent size. God instructed Noah to build it large enough to carry seven pairs of every clean beast. Seven pairs of every fowl. And one pair of every unclean beast in order to keep the seed alive upon the face of all the earth. Genesis 7, 2 and 3. Concerning the sheer size of Noah's ark, we learned that the ark built by Noah was to be about 450 feet long. That's 300 cubics. 75 feet wide. That's 50 cubics wide. And 45 feet high, which is 30 cubics high. Today, one recognizes this to be one and one half times the length of a football field with lower second and third stories, three floors. Some of you have been able to witness an ark in Kentucky that has been built to those dimensions. But the ark would be a great large vessel of no less than 100,000 square feet of space and a volume of no less than 1,500,000 cubic feet, excluding the tempers. Its displacement tonnage would be about 24,000 tons. I would have to say that if there was ever to be a worldwide flood again, but we know that God said there would not be because he placed something in the sky that said he would never destroy it by flood, and that's the rainbow. But if it ever was, I had a lot of people's going to be heading to Kentucky. <laughs> yeah, they want to get on that ark. Yeah. So why would God command Noah to build such a large vessel? Number five, it had to be strong enough to save eight souls, one family family one family and the animals from the destructive power of a worldwide flood God said of the flood for yet seven days and I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights and every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth Genesis 7 4 Moses provided enough more details or provided even more details when he wrote that the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened up, Genesis 7, 11. The psalmist even tells us and declared that during the flood that the mountains rose, the valleys sank down unto the place which thou hast founded for them, Psalm 104, verse 8. And number six we find that there was only one ark. Noah was told by God, commanded by God, to build an ark. An ark. That means one. There was no need for another. There was no need for uh, any other thing to be built as well. And thus, no lifeboats would be carried because there is no need. 
for that as well. And so truly, the ark was the only place of safety whereby anyone who would have repented could have been on that ark. I thought about that many times. What if? What if somebody else would have said, I believe that God is my father. And I believe if I'm not on that ark, I would be lost. I f truly believe that the ark was big enough to not only carry eight souls, which is Noah's family, and all those animals. Now, a lot of people want to attribute what the animals we have today as being the same animals that were back then. Uh, there wasn't that many. That the ark was big enough to carry all of those people that were living if only they would have repented. How long did Noah preach to those people why he's building that ark? How long did it take him to build the ark? It was about 100 to 120 years. Now, that might not have been a long time for them because Noah lived to be 600 and something. But 120 years to us is quite a long time. They, there isn't anybody that's ever lived that I know of or that's living today has met 120. But 100 years, we got a 96-year-old who's going to be 97 here next month. And 100 years. Think about it. So the ark was big enough with the first, second, and third stories with uh, plenty of room if everybody would have repented that were living at that time. But God knew that it's quite possible that he wouldn't. But God was willing because that's why he says that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He had the opportunity to teach and he hoped that people would then find their way. Now, I think we skipped one, didn't we? Number two, didn't we? We didn't, we said it was lively stones? Living stones? Oh, I done, I done jumped ahead. Okay. I'm jumping over to the other thing. Don't mind me. So now you know the answer to number two. All right. So one ark, no lifeboats, saved by water, number seven. Saved by water. Truly the ark was the only place of safety. Number, number eight, they were saved in the ark. Saved from the flood. By the water. Certain death awaited those who remained outside of the ark. And number nine, Destruction was to all that were outside the ark. Destruction was to all outside the ark. I've always thought, we as preachers always, always kidded each other about uh, the very last sermon that Noah preached. That very last sermon. The title of it was, How Long Can You Tread Water? <laughs> How long can you tread water? Now, just being on the ark didn't mean that Noah didn't have something to do. Noah had plenty of work to do. He had to feed the animals. Something had to be done. Noah and his family are busy doing all they can to make sure 
that the animals are comfortable, and that the animals are fed. So there's work to do. There was probably a bunch of other work that needed to be done too at the bottom of that boat as well. And then number 11, after leaving the ark, they were told to be fruitful and multiply. To be fruitful and multiply. Why? Only eight souls on the earth at the time. You think about, you know, we, we kid each other about, uh, well, I, I'm all the way back from Noah. You know, Noah's my an- ancestry. You know, some would say Adam and Eve. Well, uh, it might be, but uh, Noah, really, because everybody else died. But Noah and his family... That's our lineage. And after they left that ark, they were to be fruitful and to multiply, thus fill the earth. That word replenish means to fill the earth. And then number 12, on the ark side, there's one hope that's realized because there's life in the new world. Life on a new world or in the new world. All right, questions or thoughts about the ark side? Blanks. Let's fill those in. Don't leave with a blank. You leave with a blank. Can I help you? <laughs> I can. All I gotta do is ask me. All right, so everybody got their Blanks filled in, no longer blank. All right? Well, just as Noah's ark was a place of salvation from physical death, the church of the New Testament is a place of salvation from spiritual death. Salvation in the church that Jesus built. So who's the builder on the church side? Jesus or Christ, God's beloved son. He's the builder. How did he purchase that? How did Jesus become the builder? Why why was it that he said in Matthew 16 and 18 that But upon this rock I will build my church. Future tense at that time. How did he bring the church into being? He purchased it with his blood. That's right. Yes. He purchased it with his blood. So the builder is Christ. The church is the antitype of the salvation that's found in Noah's Ark. Now, there was only one material that is to be used as the church. Living stones. Living stones. 1 Peter 2, 5. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Jesus shed his blood to purchase the church of which we can be a part of and we are the church. This is just a building. This room is not the sanctuary. We are the church and we are the sanctuary. Not this building. One material that makes up the church, and that is the living stones. Number three, how has that all been possible for us to know? By one light, the Bible. The Bible. Psalm 119, 105, it is a light unto our pathway a light into 
God adds the saved to the church. All 3,000 converts on the day of Pentecost were added to the church. They didn't join the church. It wasn't a club. It wasn't a moose lodge. They didn't join the church. They were added to the church. Acts 2.47. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Those added to the church were obviously outside the church prior to their salvation. Which means that there's only one entrance, number four. There's only one entrance into the church. And that's through whom? Christ, Jesus. Who is, yeah, and also the door. John 10, 9, he says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. There's only one entrance into the church, and Christ is the door. Now, what is it that, maybe I don't want to get too far ahead here, because I'm thinking ahead. All right. Just as no person could have been saved outside of Noah's Ark, no person can be saved outside of the church as well that Jesus built. How do we know this? Well, the church is the body of Christ, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And surely no one can be saved outside of the body of Christ. The church of the New Testament is the kingdom of God, John 3, 3 and 5. And surely one must be a member of the kingdom of God to be able to enter heaven as well. So the church is the bride of Christ, Ephesians 5, 22 and 23. And surely only the bride of Christ will live with him forever. And so number five, there's only one family. Those who have been added to the church The church is the family of God, the body of Christ, God's family. In using just one ark to save Noah and his family, God hinted at one place of salvation for Christians, and that's the one church that Jesus built. Jesus preached that upon this rock I will build my church, Matthew 16 and 18. And it should also be noted that my church refers to only one. He didn't say, I will build my churches and you have a choice. No. When it comes to the church, there is no choice. There is only the one family, the one church, number six. The one church. His church. Not a man-made institution. There are so many out there in the world that are following men. You know, we, even what we're learning in Jeremiah is the very fact that we're not to follow men. You know, follow men that make idols. Follow men that make things out of wood and stone that they would then worship that can't reciprocate. reciprocate all right? Now, from another vantage point, salvation has been located in a particular place, namely in Christ Jesus, 2 Timothy 2.10. And that the only way to get into Christ and be saved is to be baptized into him, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Paul taught, for as many as you have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Not only are sinners baptized into Christ, but they are baptized into one body as well. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. And the body is the church. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. So to be baptized then is to enter Christ and his church, wherein God has placed salvation. Just as salvation from the flood was in the ark, Salvation from sin is in the church. His church in Christ. And thus, number seven, we are saved by baptism. Now, 
we need to look at 1 Peter 3.21, don't we? Let's go to 1 Peter 3 and let's uh, back up just a hair to verse 20. And we'll look at 20 and 21. 1 Peter 3, 20 and 21. Which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. The like figure, wherein to now baptism, now also does save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So baptism can save you. But will baptism alone save you? No. Just like faith alone won't save you, belief alone won't save you, repentance alone won't save you, making a good confession won't save you alone, and baptism alone will not save you as well. But when you put all those together, by faith, believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, will cause you to want to make a change in your life called repentance. Thus you would make that good confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and then put the Lord on in baptism for the remission of your sins. Thus all of those different steps allows you into that one entrance where Jesus is the door into the church the body of Christ, the saved. Pretty simple enough, huh? And then you have to live faithfully, that's right. Yeah, that's right. There are only two positions of significance in Noah's day. Inside the ark and saved from the flood or outside the ark and doomed to drowning. Likewise, in keeping with the tide, there are only two positions of significance today. You're either inside the body, the church of Christ, and saved from hell, or outside the body, the church of Christ, and condemned to eternal death. Those are the only positions. And sadly, the world rejects that simple truth. Just as the antediluvians rejected the notion of getting into the ark before the flood by their repentance, 2 Peter 2.5, the one church that Jesus built is the New Testament antitype of the one ark built by Noah. And just as God had accomplished the salvation of eight souls with one ark, he secures the salvation of all of them that obey. Christ, Hebrews 5, 9. And so within the one church, it is possible to find this one church. Or is it possible to find this one church and become a member of it today? Yes, it is. So number eight, we are saved in Christ and in the... Go ahead, you can say it. Church, yeah. Don't be afraid. You can say the wrong answer. We'll correct you. (laughs) But say by or in Christ and in the church. So, you know, when men compromise the truth of God, bad things happen. With the rain falling and the floodwaters rising, it was too late to get into Noah's Ark, which was the only designated place of safety during the flood. And as a consequence of sin, every human being that's outside the ark perish. And by that, anybody outside the church will perish. All flesh died that moved upon the earth, every living thing 
was destroyed, which was upon the face of the ground, both men and cattle, and the creeping things, and the fowl of the heavens, and they were destroyed from the earth, and Noah only remained alive. And his wife, his three sons, and their wives, and they were with him in the ark. Number nine. The destruction of those outside the ark was a result of sin. So the destruction was complete and final. But it only came after 120 years of warnings from Noah, who is the preacher of righteousness, Genesis 6, 3, and 2 Peter 2, 5. God in his mercy gave mankind adequate warning before the flood. But the world then didn't listen. We as preachers and teachers, members of the Lord's church, are to go out and teach others that there is only one way into heaven, and that's through the church. So we need to warn these people. And hopefully they will listen. Number 10. There is the work to be done in the church. Noah had work to do. He had to feed the animals. What is the work that is to be done in the church? How are we fed as Christians? By the word of God. That's right. Like a newborn babe desires the sense was desires milk, we are to desire the sincere milk of the word, and that is the Bible, God's word. We're to be fed as well. But there's work to be done in the church. What is what else is has to be done? God gave one doctrine to his one church, and he said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you, and lo, I'll be with you always, even unto the end of the world, Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Or to go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be condemned, Mark 16, 15 and 16. So in regard to Jesus' great commission, all of us, and especially us as preachers in Christ, church, are charged, the same commit thou unto faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. Every one of us ought to take note of the fact that every man outside that ark was destroyed and their annihilation foreshadows the sobering New Testament truth that those outside the Lord's church will also perish as well. And those inside the ark were saved from the flood. Those outside the ark were not. And in the same way, inside the church are saved from sin, while those outside the church are lost in sin. And so there is work to be done that is spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now the Lord, oh, yes. You don't think I believe that? Yeah, I, I, was, I was trying to picture what you're, you're saying now. I've got it. We make such, so much preparation when it comes to the things, the nature, the nature of the earth, God's nature, that if a hurricane was to come or a tornado or something, we make preparation because we want to be prepared for when that time comes with the water and, the, and everything else. Generators, the whole world. But we're so interested in the physical things, how come we're not in the spiritual things when it comes to our soul to be prepared 
for that judgment day? Is it because we kind of know when the hurricane's coming, we just don't know where? But you don't know when a tornado's going to touch down. They'll just come down anywhere, anytime. I, 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 th- I think I'd rather live through a hurricane because I know where it's going to go eventually. And I can get away from it, maybe. But a tornado, I can't. Earthquake, you can't. But we make so much preparation physically. But why aren't we doing it spiritually when it comes to our soul? Well, because we don't know when that time's going to come. That means we always have to be prepared, don't we? For we know not when that time will come where the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9. And so... Just as being in the ark saved Noah from the flood, being in the church will save Christians from the flaming fire that will destroy the earth and its inhabitants. Number 11. We are commanded to be fruitful and multiply. John 15, 1 through 6. We need to be fruitful and multiply. We are commanded to be fruitful and multiply. And multiply or bear commanded to, what do we have? (laughs) Did I not put it down as that? Commanded to be fruitful or bear fruit. To be fruitful or bear fruit. Multiply. Why? God is not willing that any should perish. We should not be willing that any should perish. And yet we have many people around us that we know that's going to perish. We got work to do. We need to be fruitful and multiply. Even though God has designated Noah's Ark as a place of safety and escape from the flood, only eight chose to enter. Similarly, all men this side of Calvary have been warned that the heavens and the earth which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men, 2 Peter 3, 7. How sad it is that most people today reject God's designated place of safety, the Lord's church. And those outside of God's designated place of safety will one day perish. So thus, number 12, there is only one hope to attain life eternal, right? Life eternal, eternal. There is only one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is in you all and through you all, Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. So there's only one hope to attain eternal life. And now is the day of salvation. Tomorrow may be too late. We need to be ready at all times. Any questions, thoughts about that? Any blanks? Maybe I skipped one. Go ahead. Yeah, that's wrong. (laughs) Maybe 15, 4 through 6. You caught me, I'm human. I don't think it's four through six either. Well, we know it's Ephesians 4 4. Right now, I don't remember what 15 was. Any other questions or thoughts? Blanks? Any blanks? No. Brother Dick. All of this that we've studied for the last two weeks comes down to a term that we don't use properly. Believe. Believe. Mm-hmm. Believe is a term where you can see and understand but if you don't make it operate, then doesn't fit the passages the way they're supposed to. 
with you, right? And when we don't do what we're supposed to, we're not truly believing what we say we do. And when that last faith goes around, Jesus will say, I never knew you. If you love me, Plural. keep my commandments. Yeah. Plural. That's all. If you keep my commandments, then you shall know. Oh, okay. The truth. Right. And the truth will make you free. Now, all the truth in the world can be good before us. Because if we're not ready to operate within that truth, how good is it? Sad, sad, yes. yes. Belief involves faith and trust, faith and obedience. So it's not a, just a mental act. We have to do. So based on what we believe, what we trust, we have to obey. Trust and obey. Very important. That's faith and action. And that's what uh, Brother Dick is telling us. So we need to be faithful members of the Lord's church. All right. Thank you for your kind attention. And we'll pick up from there next week. Open your songbooks, if you will, to number 218. And then mark that as the song of encouragement. That's 218. Two, one, eight. And after you have marked that, let's sing number 213. Two, one, three. To the work. To the work. Two, one, three.
number 218 is a song of encouragement. There's a fountain free. Based on what we just learned in class tonight, that if Noah had built more than one ark, if he would have built it bigger or shorter than 300 cubits, or wider or shorter than 50 cubits, or taller or shorter than 30 cubits in height, he would have displeased God. And thus, he probably would not have been on the ark as well. Even if Noah's intentions were good, the building of more than one ark would have displeased God. Well, in the same way that if there's the building of more than one church, it cannot be pleasing to the Savior. When Jesus himself said, I will build my church, which equals to one. His apostles said that they may be one. John 17, 11, he, Jesus prayed about that. Not only did he pray for his apostles, but he prayed for the followers as well to be unified as one. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, that the world may know, may believe that thou hast sent me. John 17, 20, 21. So just as God has sanctioned one ark to save Noah, he sanctions just one church to be saved or to save mankind. There is one body which is governed by the one faith. Ephesians 4, 3 and 4. For which all of us as Christians are to earnestly contend for that faith. Jude 3. So just as souls were saved in the ark built by Noah, salvation is promised to all those who entered the one church built by Jesus of Nazareth. Sadly, some will choose to remain outside the blood-bought church of our Lord, and these will be lost just as those outside of Noah's ark who made their choice and thus perished in the flood. Oh, how God's people today need to proclaim the need to get into God's one designated place of safety, the church. If you're here not a Christian, you are considered an alien sinner, one who will be lost if you do not obey the gospel and enter into that one church that Jesus built and purchased with his own blood on the cross of Calvary. Do you have faith in believing that? That Jesus is the Son of the living God. John 8, 24 says that if you don't, you're going to die in your sins. Are you willing to make a change in your life called repentance? Luke 13, 3. Acts 17, 30. Or else we'll perish if we don't. Repent. Turn away. What about the confession? To confess His sweet name to all these many witnesses that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. We can read about that in Acts 8 and 37 where the eunuch said, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then they commanded the chariot to stand still and they both went down into the water and Philip baptized the eunuch. And the eunuch went up out of the water and went on his way rejoicing. He had salvation. And you can do that even tonight by your faith and believing that Jesus is the Christ, repentance of your sins, that good confession, and being baptized in that watery grave. Everything's ready. We're ready to take you even tonight because tomorrow 
may be too late. You need to be in the one church, the body of Christ, in order to have salvation. Now, maybe you've already done that. Maybe you've already obeyed the gospel that you wandered away. This was, was just expressed earlier that we had to, there's another step that we had to remember, and that's to live faithfully. Brother Dick just said that we need to be faithful members, not just members, but faithful members. You know, Paul used the illustration of our arms and our legs and, and such as, as members of the body. In the same way, by contrast, the members of the church, the body of Christ. And just like we expect our members to be faithful to us, to feed us, to work, to get us to the place we need to go, what about the members of the church? They should be faithful members and doing all they can, doing the work of the church in every way. And if you've not done that, then you've wandered off. Maybe sin has crept back into your life. You need to repent of that and pray that God will forgive you, Acts 8, 22. We hope that we can help you tonight to either obey the gospel, become a child of God, or to be restored back to that first love. We hope that you'll make that decision because there is a fountain free and Jesus is that fountain. Won't you come as together we stand and sing this song? There's a fountain free, tis for you and me. Let us haste, oh, haste to its break. Tis the fount of love from the source above, and he bids us all freely drink. Will you come to the fountain free? Will you come? Tis for you and me, thirsty soul. Hear the welcome call. Tis a fountain open for all. There's a rock that's cleft and no soul is left that may not in pure water share. Tis for you and me, and a stream I see. Let us hasten joyfully there. Will you come to the fountain free? Will you come? Tis for you and me, thirsty soul. Hear the welcome call, tis a fountain open for all. I forgot my announcement sheet. Keeping your prayers, those that are on our sick list, they're listed in the bulletin, and, and uh, we mentioned them uh, last Sunday. But keep them in mind, uh, Teresa who is still undergoing her treatments. Keep her in your prayers. Also, Tim Adams, as he is uh, going through his treatments as well with his uh, lungs. But also, uh, Bob Hadsock, who's got some upcoming tests that needs to be done. Keep him in your prayers. Linda is sick tonight and unable to be out. There are so many others that we can mention, but you know who they are. And you get the bulletin, you can look at those lists. But keep them in your public and private prayers. And we're so thankful for your coming tonight and being with us. Don't forget about the, uh, those that had signed up for the graduation party on Saturday at 1 o'clock. And we look forward to seeing you there as well. Anything else I might have overlooked that I need to mention? Brother Mark, would you lead us in the closing prayer?
Amen.